Welcome to the de Havilland Aircraft Museum. Most of you will probably recognize that this is the front fuselage of an early mark of Comet. And you probably know that at the museum, we do have the only example of a full fuselage of a Comet Mark I. But this is not a Comet Mark I. It's not even the Mark IV. This is a Mark II. Only 15 of these type of aircraft ever flew. But this particular aircraft is even more unusual because it wasn't an RAF transport plane. It wasn't a commercial plane. At the height of the Cold War, this was a plane that lurked in the shadows. This was a spy plane. This particular Mark II was originally destined for BOAC, but fate had a different future in mind. So it was handed over to 216 Squadron at RAF Lynham, and it was used for transport, evacuation, and VIP transport. Later on, it was one of only seven aircraft that was specially converted by Marshals of Cambridge for a new secret mission. Funding for that conversion was provided by GCHQ, the Government Communications Headquarters. Once converted externally, it had a few additional ray domes and additional aerials. It could accommodate a crew of six and a dozen or so avionics experts. After the conversion, it served with 51 Squadron. Its new role was to fly secret ELINT, or electronic intelligence missions, along the borders of the Warsaw Pact. They would record radar signals and eavesdrop on military communications. The Comet 2R were deployed on what were called ferret flights in different parts of the world. The Barents Sea, north of Norway, along the Baltic Sea, and others were detached to Cyprus where they could look at the Black Sea. And officially, they were known as radio proving flights. The flight programs were so secret they had to be approved directly by the Prime Minister and each flight had to be authorised individually by the UK Secretary of State. There were some very clear rules about these flights. They had to take place over friendly or neutral territory. They had to be in international airspace. They were not allowed to approach any closer than 30 nautical miles to Soviet or Warsaw Pact territory. And they couldn't fly directly towards them. Instead, they had to fly parallel with the coast. Most of the time, this was in half moonlight or in total darkness with strict radio silence. Sometimes these flights would be conducted with a Canberra bomber. The Canberra bomber would fly towards Warsaw Pact territory. Meanwhile, the comet would be flying high parallel. The Canberra would suddenly fly high and trigger the Warsaw Pact air defenses. Meantime, our comet would be listening in on the radar and all the radio signals. So this sort of information was then fed back to the RAF operations team. This enabled them to refine their planning in case the Cold War went hot. We hope you've enjoyed this video and an insight into an unusual variant of the Comet. Later on, that spy role was of course taken over by the famous Nimrod, which was a version of the Comet, but that's a story for another day. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe, share on social media, and do check out our website for our, our opening hours. Come down to the museum where you can see this particular version of the Comet and others, and you can see the original Comet one as well. See you at the museum.